kind of a different service, and that's very intentional, and it's very purposeful, and we'll talk about the significance of that in just a second. But before I do that, let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into this service, into the message, into the songs, into the prayers, and into our time together. So would you extend your hands in agreement? Lord, we thank you so much for the good things you've given us. We thank you for our kids. We thank you for our young families. We thank you for our young adults. We thank you. And yeah, we, we're, we're thankful for old people too. We're thankful for everybody. <laughs> and it's so good for us to be together. And it's so good for us to be a family. And it's so good for us to experience worship and our time together as family. Because that's what you made us. That's what you created us to be in the church. Will your Holy Spirit do all the talking today? Will you speak through the songs, the message, our children, our, our time of training, all the things that you have for us today? Will you, will you encourage us with those things? In the mighty name of Jesus, we all said, Amen. So, years ago, I talked to a particular student who was a high school student, and he had just graduated. He was just graduated high school, getting ready to go off to college. And he was completely confused and I think um, a little anxious about what was ahead of him for church life. And, and when he said it, I remember I was a little confused myself because I was thinking, well, this is your church. This is your home. This is your family. And I don't remember the exact words he used, but he essentially expressed to me that all of his growing up, when he would come to church with his family, his family, his parents would go into the main assembly. He'd go to either kids' church when he was young, or he'd go to kids' church you know, up through elementary, or the middle school or the high school would have something special for the teenage kids. And literally, his whole upbringing in church he was hardly ever in the main assembly. And he literally said, this doesn't feel like my church. This doesn't feel like my place. I need to find my church, whatever it, that might be. And remember that was devastating to me. It was devastating because I think I made the assumption as a pastor, as a parent, um, that that would just kind of happen almost by osmosis. You know what I mean? that kids would just understand that, of course, this is your church. Of course, this is your family. But I realized there were not relationships. There were not connections. There was not a sense of all of us being in church, all of us worshiping together, all of us praying together, all of us experiencing together God's goodness. And I decided that day, I, we, we can't let that happen. Young people after they graduate high school or at an all-time high of just leaving the church altogether. One of my uh, youth pastors in the past few years shared with me her sorrow and her discouragement that she could not think of one of her students that at that time was still faithful in their commitment to God after they had left the church, so to speak. And so I want you to understand that when we talk about Family Sunday, that, that's not some cute genre idea that we've come up with just to, just to make a Sunday interesting on the first Sunday of the month. I really believe with all my heart that we have a responsibility and that maybe, maybe even churches across the nation maybe even need to wake up a little bit to the reality that church is meant to be experienced on all levels, by all ages, by all walks of life, by all nationalities. And I think for a lot of us, we, we make that mistake of assumption. We think our kids get what we get. We think that they already understood or already understand what we learned growing up. And I just want to say, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think it automatically happens. And so Family Sunday for me is a time when as a church, as young parents, you have the opportunity to, as Paul says, raise your kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I know you do it at home. I know you're interacting with them at home. But there's a special reality that happens when God's people come together on the first day of the week. They worship together. 
They pray together. They take the Lord's Supper together. And helping our children, not only, not only inviting them into that reality, but, but training them, helping them to engage, helping them to be connected, I think is an essential thing that we, we have to do if we're serious about the longevity of the church in America. If we're serious about our, our kids growing up and loving the Lord and living a life for Him. The Proverbs writer says in Proverbs 22, 6, train a child up in the way he should go, and even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. I want to I take a moment, and, and the message today will kind of be split up throughout the morning, but I want to take a moment and I just want to encourage everybody in here. This Family Sunday has something for all of us. There's a lot in this that I want to encourage young parents with. Young parents, I want to encourage you to train your kids during this time and to use this time as a way to invite them in and help them engage in what we're doing as a church. Some of you might be saying, well, my kids are all out of the house. Or some of you, I don't have kids. Or some of you, I'm not even married yet, right? And you might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with me? I want to encourage you too that So much of what we're going to talk about centers at the heart of the most fundamental aspects of our walk with God. You remember what Jesus said when the disciples were like, hey, we've got a lot going on. We're super busy. We don't have time for the kids. Could Could you get the kids away from Jesus? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, stop. Let let those kids come to me. Of such are the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the nature, the spirit, the ability to grasp and hold on to and and follow God is almost inherent in kids. It's almost something that is there when they're young and it's as we become adults, as the world affects us, it's almost like we forget. It's almost like we disconnect. And so I want to encourage you that for Jesus to say something like, hey, this is a picture of the kingdom of God. That means to me that it's, it's not just training children that we're talking about. It's training all of us as adults. It's helping us all to be childlike again in our singing, in our prayer time, in our worship, even when we take communion. And we're going to talk about all those fundamental pieces of worship today and even give you time to, if you're a young family with kids, give you time to actually process that today with your kids. And the rest of us are going to take a second look and say, you know, I'm so used to doing communion or I'm so used to the public prayer, so used to singing the songs with the words on the screen. I want you to slow down and and take a second look and, and try to Ask the Lord, hey, give give me a childlike heart as I approach this worship, as I approach these prayers, as I as I do communion. And I think the Lord will bless us for that. There's a green sheet in your little packet if you got it. I sent this letter out Friday. There's just two parts that I want to read in it, in case you didn't get it or in case you didn't have a chance to read it. And it's right in the middle of the letter. It's basically a letter encouraging you about today, encouraging you about the reason we're having Family Sunday. And then I just had a few guidelines for us to consider in this season of training both our young parents, young families, and also the rest of us who should be supporting them in a strong way. I'd like to read just one and two, and then we're going to move forward in our service today. Number one. Our, our, our time of worship is, is meant to be a joyful celebration. It's meant to have freedom. But it's a balance. It's a striking of a balance between engaging freely in worship while still showing respect for others. And what that means is that we encourage young parents to invite their children into the service. Now, you guys that are young parents, I'm looking at you right now. I'm seeing... Little children, I'm seeing the, uh, the mezzanine up there. 
I know you, some of you got your arms full. We get that. We understand that. I want to encourage you today, take this worship time, take this service as an opportunity to speak into your kids at whatever level they're able to understand, to model for them practices of the singing we're going to do, of the prayer time, listening to the message of communion. And the goal is, is for them not only to see you doing those things and for you to help them engage, but the goal is also on whatever level you can, share the significance, share the meaning of what you're doing. And it may be very simple. It may be, hey, we're thanking God right now because He's been so good to us. It may be saying, hey, you know why we bow our head? Because, because we honor God and we, we recognize how good He's been to us. You may talk to Him about communion. We're, we're going to talk about specifically today singing, prayer, and communion. And I hope that gives you opportunity to do what you need to do in that situation. And we do it also while respecting others around us who are participating in worship. And this is what Paul means when he says everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Now that's what I share with the young parents. Now let me share something with everybody else. Okay? Encouraging and supporting young parents and the process of diligent training. I've, this is a balance. I've been a young parent. I have four kids. I've been a young parent. I've, I've been a single parent for a period of time. I know how hard and how difficult it can be. I know that parents sometimes think, man, this is so difficult. I, I don't even, maybe I'll just stay home and we'll watch the service on television. Or maybe we'll just stay home because I'm just afraid I'm not going to have enough help or it's going to be too loud or I'm going to be disturbing somebody else. Let, 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 me, let me set a spirit here among the rest of us that I think is vital. Encouraging and supporting young parents in the process of diligent training. Inviting children into the larger service and training them to both engage and at the same time respect others and their time of worship can be a formidable task for young and or single parents. It's a process that does not happen all at once. The rest of us can greatly support them and the process by not getting upset, not getting frustrated. If you hear a crying baby, that's hypothetical, or, <laughs> or other distractions common with young children during the training process. Go one step further. Now listen, it's not enough not to just get frustrated. Encourage parents. Encourage these parents. We've got some great young families. I'm looking at them. They're awesome. And I love that their kids are here. And I love that they bring their kids. Encourage these young parents. Encourage these young families with hopeful, hope-filled, supportive words. You're doing a good job. Hang in there. I know, I know right now at this age it's tough. But go one step further. Maybe offer to help hold a child. Or let one sit with you while a parent is tending to one of their siblings. Now make sure they know you so they don't feel like you're taking their child or kidnapping the child, right? But develop a relationship with them and say, hey, let me help. Or hey, I've got a, you know, I, I love, Larry's got the suckers back there. He can draw them in, you know. <laughs> draw them in. He, he's my supplier. He's my dealer. I've got, I've got two suckers in my pocket he just gave me before we started today. Do things with intentionality that say, we're going to come alongside you. We're going to support, encourage you, and help you instead of you feeling judged or, or criticized or anxious because, you, you, because it's impossible to keep no sound and no movement from ever happening. You hear what I'm saying? So Family Sunday, it, it's very meaningful to me. It's why I've taken the time to share with you what I have just now. It's why I've written this letter. It's why we've dedicated the first Sunday of every month to it. I, I am committed to it. And I think we all should be. And I think a lot of good can happen from it. And I think the Lord's going to bless us in a special way. So Deborah's going to come up now. And we're going to have 
some special time of worship. And I encourage you as parents and as people that are supporting those parents, help invite these kids into worship. Engage them in the songs. And we'll talk about singing. We'll talk about prayer. And we'll talk about communion today on Family Sunday. Okay, so today um, Adeline volunteered to do a scripture reading for us this morning. And she actually memorized the scripture to read. So we're going to let her do that. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Can you help me? Psalm 147. Forty seven. Five. And great is our Lord. And there's another. And mighty. And power. I have, um, I have got problems. Okay. When I go to a movie, I always end up sitting by somebody who when they eat popcorn, they eat it so loud. You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody have those issues? Nobody? I'm sure somebody in here is. And why they even introduced nachos, I have no idea. But people eating nachos in movies, it's hard for me. I have to really focus. I remember a buddy of mine that I'd go with to the movies every now and then. He had that issue of very loud eating, but he also had another issue. He, he would just laugh at completely the wrong times in the movie. <laughs> I mean, just scenarios where, you know, I, why are you laughing? This is a you know, very serious moment, or this is a very heart-wrenching moment, and he just would ruin it for me, so I didn't even want to go. Didn't even want to be a part of it. I say all that to say that it's interesting how we navigate and how we process things that are, that are appropriate um, and sensing appropriate uh, approaches to not just things we're viewing or not things just that we're a part of, but especially in worship. We just sang two songs that were glorifying songs. They were praise songs. They were adoration songs. They're meant to be songs as Deborah read Psalm 150. They're meant to be songs where we're glorifying God, where we're, we're shout, your, shout to the Lord, clap your hands, all you people. The, the Psalms are full of passages that point to this type of worship. But there's another type of worship. And that other type of worship is worship where, we, where we're intentionally reflective. And what I mean by reflective is, is that there's not a lot of noise. There's a time where it, it, quiet, it quiets down, both in terms of our surroundings, but it also quiets down in terms of what's inside of us and in terms of our soul, right? And reflective times, we also have to train our children to recognize those. We also have to recognize those in a way because reflective songs are more intuitive from the perspective of us thinking about our own relationship with God, or us thinking about our brothers and sisters and their relationship with God. There's this great passage in Ephesians 5 and verse 19 that says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. Some of your versions say, speaking and singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So there is this aspect of, yes, we are singing to God and we're worshiping God, but there's also this aspect, and this is a big part of why God created church, why He created the assembly. There's another aspect that even in the midst of our worship, we are, we are being encouraged in our, in our hearts, in our spirits, and we are also intentionally encouraging others. And those types of songs have powerful meaning. They have powerful significance. And there are things that I think we need to recognize. Okay, this is a reflective time. This is a time for quiet. This is a time for quieting our souls. And so if you're young parents and you're teaching your, your kids in, in an assembly or in a worship service, being able to say, okay, hey, whispering in their ear, hey, we're going to be quiet now, or we're going to reflect. We're going to think on the inside 
about God's goodness. We're going to thank Him for His goodness. And we're going to we're going to sing in a way where we're not only encouraging our own hearts, but we're encouraging others around us. And that reflective kind of worship, I think, is one that's very important and very much a part of our assemblies when we come together. How many of you are, I'm going to call Deborah back up now for this, this next reflective song. How many of you would say that some of the most encouraging, if not the most encouraging uh, practices that you can be involved with in your spiritual feeding, in your spiritual life, is worship, is worship songs. Anybody? A lot of us. A lot of people. We, we can forget the message tonight that I share with you, but these songs that we learn and the intricacies of them and how deeply they touch our spirit, that's a powerful part of worship. And as we worship together, being able to understand when it's time for joy and celebration and excitement and when it's time for reflection is part of what it means to be in the assembly together. We're going to sing another song now of reflection. When we come together as a church, when we come together in the assembly, what we do. When Deborah and I were, were processing the message today and the service today and, and all the things that we wanted to do, we realized that that there is a reality for us as adults that the things that we do every Sunday when we come together, because we do them every Sunday, because we're used to the rote nature of it, you know, we sing, we have an opening, we have announcements, we have meet and greet, we have three songs, we have a message. If it's communion Sunday, we have communion. We have two songs afterwards and then we're done. We get used to a pattern, we get used to a rhythm, and it's so easy for the things that we're so familiar with to cease having meaning. Does that make sense? And so I want to encourage you as an adult, whether you're married, whether you have a family or not, I want to encourage you as, a, as an adult to rethink when I'm together with the assembly and we pray, what is the significance of that? What's the meaning of that? What's the value of that? If we look at Philippians 4, 6, it says, don't worry about anything. Well, let's just stop there for a second. When you're worried and anxious, I know that your favorite thing is for someone just to say, hey, don't worry. <laughs> right? That doesn't work or it doesn't feel like it works. It feels like when people say, hey, don't, don't stress. Don't be angry. Don't get anxious. And in the midst of our anxiety, it's really hard not to. But Paul goes on. It's, it's more than just don't worry. Instead, pray. And pray about everything. I've said this a couple of times from the pulpit. We will say, well, all we got now, all we can do now is what? Pray. And that's after we've tried everything else and we've finally gotten to an anxiety level that we realize we're not in control. But what Paul is saying is as soon as that anxiety hits you, as soon as fear hits you, pray about it. Pray about it. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He's done. We're going to do something now that I, I think is an important thing to do. And again, we're all learning. We're growing together as families, as young families, with kids, as adults, as supporting. Let's take some time today to pray together. Let's take some time today. Young families, I'm going to ask you guys, ask your kids now. Pull them close and ask them, hey, we're going to take a moment to pray. What would you like to tell God? What would you like to thank him for? You know, I know, I know depending on the age of a child, it's very, it can be very difficult to communicate some particular concept or process. Uh, or it might be that they're old enough to understand some of the deeper things. You'll have to gauge that with your child. But I encourage you now, take this time to pull them in and just whisper in there and say, hey, we're going to have a little time of prayer right now. Let's... Let's ask God for things that we need. 
Let's thank God right now for the good things that He's given us in life. And you know what? The rest of us are going to do that too. So right now, I want to encourage you. If, if there's people on your row, feel free to get with them. Young families, if you would, pull your kids in and have a moment of prayer. If some of you right now are sitting alone and you're like, oh my gosh, I am scared to death at this point, and you just want to pray by yourself, that is completely fine. But let's take some time right now, some quiet, because this is one of those times of reflection. This is one of those times when we're reaching out to God. And let's just pray. You can look to the person on your right or left and group with them and pray for a few moments. We've got our young adults up here. Pray with the person next to you. Pray over them. Pray with them. Um, and let's just take a moment, thank God, ask Him what we need, and be grateful for what He's already done in our life. Can we do that? Yeah. Is that going to be weird to do that for a few minutes with nothing going on up front? Yeah. Well, that means we're growing a little bit, <laughs> right? So we're going to take a few minutes. I'm going to step down from the pulpit. I'm going to be praying too. Let's take about three minutes and let's encourage. If you can't think of anything to pray about, pray for our young families as they're raising their kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay? Let's take a few moments to pray. Lord, I'm going to just say a prayer over all of us right now. I thank you for this time. Thank you for this chance that we can pray over each other, pray together get prayed over. Lord, I thank you also for this opportunity to whisper into our children's ears and to just practice with them in the assembly. Hey, let's, let's pray. Let's thank God. Let's ask God for what we need. Lord, I, I picture you, Jesus. I picture you as just the kindest, gentlest, most approachable person. And I know we forget that as adults, but I pray that you give our children that sense of your presence, that they feel your warmth and your gentleness and your love, not condemnation, not, uh, not a sense that you're just waiting for them to make a mistake so that you can punish them. Lord, some of us grew up that way. Some of us grew up thinking of God in those terms. And I pray you break through any of those attempts of the enemy to, to cloud their minds or even our minds as adults of who you are, how good you are, how much you love us. So thank you today for this chance to pray over one another, to pray for ourselves, to teach our children to pray. What a, what a wonderful time that we get to spend and we get to do it together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, my friends, we are uh, coming to the last part of at least what I'm going to share with you and then finish up in our worship time. Communion is probably out of all the times that we've talked about the most reflective. Communion has a, a reverent spirit around it. And it's reverent because those of us that are Christians, those of us that know the story of Jesus, we recognize the incredible price that Jesus paid for each one of us. That literally we were on the docket to die. We were on death row spiritually. We were going to be judged and punished for our mistakes. And Jesus, at the last moment, stepped in front of us and said, no, I'll take his place. I'll take her place. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around that because it's metaphorical in a sense, and yet it's utterly true. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around it because it happened 2,000 years ago. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around it because it's hard to understand the exchange of one life for another. So how do we teach our kids? <laughs> how do we teach our young kids to process something so deep 
so significant, so uh, so introspective. Well, Matthew 26, Jesus says to his disciples, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it, and then he broke it in pieces, and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this, take this, eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Sometimes simplifying things helps. Sometimes just the simplification in a child's mind is being able to say to that child, Jesus loves you so much that he, that he gave his life for you. And you just leave it at that. Maybe you just leave it at Jesus loves you so much. And we're going to think about how much Jesus loves us. Maybe sometimes as adults, just processing that and not just taking, not just taking the Lord's Supper and it being another road experience. Sometimes us just thinking, man, how he must love us is the significance that we need as we enter into the Lord's Supper. If you're with your kids right now and you can, whisper into their ear that there is a God who loved you so much that he gave up his life for you. And so we take the body of Christ. There is a man named Jesus who would do anything, who was willing to do anything. It wasn't forced on him. Nobody made him do it. God the Father didn't make him do it. He did it because he loves us so much. He took on all our pain, all our sorrow, all our guilt, all our shame, and we think of that as, an, as a moment in time 2,000 years ago, but I want to encourage you to continue to think about how that continues. And that he's still there carrying with us our hurts, our pain, our sorrows. You as parents know when your kids hurt, it's worse than when you hurt. Think about a God who loves us so much that he still not only is willing, but wants to enter into that struggle with us. He still lays himself down and provides for us what we need to not be taken under and to rise from the ashes. The suffering of Jesus we enter into with gratefulness and with adoration for the love he has for us. Well, friends, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to sing a song now that epitomizes what really communion is all about. Let's worship our Lord.